I'm Ben. I work for Westerns Archaeology uh, in Edinburgh. I'm a terrestrial archaeologist with the Coastal and Marine team, so I'm already in a high state of confusion. Um, so we'll try and work that out. Um, but in a previous life, in a less heavily tattooed life, I was also a Middle Eastern archaeologist specialising in ceramics and excavation on these places. Um, I'm going to talk to you about the Batna Expressway. The Batna is a large coastal plain in northern Oman. Uh, the expressway is connecting Muscat uh, uh, to the Ar Arab Emirates. Uh, it's a huge project, uh, split into six different packages. Quick background to the Arabian Gulf. It's a highly significant area archaeologically. Um, Oman is the prehistoric Magan, split between uh, Mesopotamia and the Indus Valley civilization during the uh, early Bronze Age, and it is the only real source of uh, copper in the area that's easy to get to um, and easily available. So it's highly significant for those two civilizations and develops into quite a major uh, trading partner during the Bronze Age. Um, the, well, it's also got lots of soft stone uh, deposits which are quite sought after during that period for uh, jewellery and vessels and other bits and bobs. It's got a wide variety of landscapes. You've got the Hajar Mountains uh, starting up in the Musandam Peninsula coming down through the Emirates and then going all the way along as the spine of Oman. Um, you've also got the huge dune fields of the empty quarter split between the Emirates, um, Oman and Saudi, and also uh, these wide coastal plains and foothills in between. Um, Omani archaeology, um, the country was almost entirely closed up until the 1970s um, due to various civil wars and uh, quite secretive rulers. Um, since then there's been a large number of European and North American teams generally working on research projects, um, majoritatively split between British, Italian and American teams. Uh, during the opening up of, of Amman, uh, following the rise to power of Sultan Qaboos, um, the a large number of ministries were created um, and one of them is the Amani Ministry of Heritage and Culture uh, which had a couple of names beforehand, but it's effective. It was created in 1975, and it's had an established director of archaeology museums since then. Uh, during 1980, uh, there was the National Heritage Protection Law, which noted the importance of recording the country's archaeological resource. It didn't actually say they had to, which means that it's, it tends to get noted and then crushed, um, which is a bit unfortunate. But uh, this is a sign from the... Oh, God, what's that from? Bat... Uh, World Heritage Site saying, please don't damage this. It's really important. Uh, it's home to four World Heritage Sites. You've got the Bakhla Fort at the top, uh, which is an Islamic period uh, fort in the mountains. Uh, Bat al Khultum and Al Ain, these uh, amazing prehistoric tombs. The Land of Frankincense and the Al Flaj irrigation systems of Oman, uh, which are all over the place actually. There's these amazing irrigation systems um, that run across the country. Commercial archaeology in Oman is uh, mostly been based around large, large infrastructure projects, mostly road building um, and for oil ex exploration. Um, in 2014, a new law, which I, could I can't find the name of, um, annoyingly, but the uh, new law was brought in making sure that all large scale developments had to uh, record all archaeology in their way, um, based along similar lines to the British system. Um, this is partly due to a dramatic increase in road building and other development within Oman, um, including in areas like the Batana that have been ignored by earlier researchers. Um, and this is an example, there's been a, uh, Italian Omani excavations at Sanal um, in the centre of the country that, have, because of this, have uncovered some fantastic camel, camel uh, burials with, in warrior graves. Oops, I haven't got any pictures off, but uh, they are amazing. Google them when you get a chance, they're fantastic. Um, the Batna Expressway is one of these major infrastructure projects. It's a 300km expressway replacing the old coast road from Muscat to Dubai. Uh, it's 20 kilometres inland in the football foothills of the Jabal Hajar. Uh, it's split into six packages. Packages 1 and 2, there wasn't a lot of archaeology according to the uh, Omani authorities. It was dug by an Omani uh, slash Italian team. Packages 3 and 4 were dug by myself and my team. Uh, package 5 by an Italian team. And package 6 by the Dutch team from the University of Leiden. Um, so here we go, this is central um, on the button is just oh button is just here. It's a coastal plain between the Hajar Mountains and the Gulf of Oman there. Um, and the package three runs from 
inland of Al Suwaik to inland of Al Khabur, and then package four runs from Al Khabur to the port, up to port, of the port city of Sahan, of um, Soha. Um, archaeological prospection along the route was mostly done uh, through remote sensing, um, because the artifacts that the Omani <coughs> Ministry were interested in are extant. We don't. There's no geophysical survey of the of the route. There's no real uh, searching for buried archaeology, it's looking at extant tombs, extant buildings. Um, if you're lucky, you catch um, a flint scatter. Uh, it was mostly done by remote sensing by members of the Rostock uh, Batana Archaeological Survey, which is based at the University of Durham, uh, and also out of Sultan Qaboos University in Muscat, um, and with um, help from the Ministry of Heritage and Culture. Um, and they located archaeology on these 16 locations along the roadway um, which had 68 tombs and other sites um, in those areas. Come on, guys. Okay. So yes, the Batna Plain runs across here. You've got the uh, foothills of the mountain of the uh, Hajar Mountains and as they come down to the flat plain, um, down to the uh, Omani Gulf, you have uh, a large number of wadi channels, dry riverbed channels that are often that, uh, are rivers during the, the wet season, and then a lot of them have these little uh, ridges in between them. And the the Batman Expressway just cuts straight across all of them. Um, the Rostock and Batman Archaeological Survey, uh, who are our sort of partners uh, on this project, um, are funded through the Anglo-Amani Anglo -Amani Society and Ministry of Heritage and Culture, and they're basically, it's noticed that the Batman is an area that has missed out on archaeological uh, work in Oman in the last 40 years. Um, it's a bit of a, a dead zone for archaeological work. And um, so they've been working out of Rostock um, to try and improve the understanding of the uh, archaeological data set within uh, Rostock Goliath and the, the Batna in general. Um, so we were able to use, with their permission, um, the survey results from their first season as a comparison with the archaeology we had uh, exposed as part of the expressway. We are working outside of a, a research framework. Um, there's no national or regional, regional uh, research frameworks for Oman, um, and therefore we're very much looking at what the Ministry asked us to look for, but also looking at what our own personal interests were in, um, which happened to be uh, tombs, tombs and uh, visible structures. Um, and mostly to try the uh, sorry uh, because we're working outside of a research framework uh, there's no legal backing apart from the law saying you have to do some archaeology for the contractors um, and the contractors realistically just want us to, to record the archaeology that they know about and they can see um, so we're only really able to uh, look at the archaeology that was extant in the area. Um, who did it? That's what happens when you let your South African colleague take a photo of you. Um, it's a small team of specialists in Middle Eastern archaeology, paleopathology and tomb excavation, uh, working with teams of labourers from the road contractors, so we tend to have 20 to 25 uh, Bengali and Bangladeshi workers um, helping us out. We're on site between mid-April and uh, mid-June, um, beginning temperatures about 30 degrees. Uh, end temperatures about 55 degrees, occasionally with 100% humidity. It was thoroughly unpleasant. Um, and uh, we developed a method methodology um, to excavate, record and excavate the tombs rapidly without losing information. Um, first stage was to locate the site, put a uh, grid layer over the tomb, uh, pole photography of the untouched tomb to make sure we had a record of the uh, pre-excavated site. Um, then a team with two archaeologists and 10 to 15 workmen cleared the, cleared the loose stone from around the tomb and inside the tomb chamber. Quick poll photo, photo of the uh, cleared unexcavated tomb rectified to the grid. Uh, an excavation team of three or four archaeologists, including the paleopath, uh, with small team workmen to assist them. And then another poll photo of um, the fully excavated tomb rectified to the grid with the potential for half section through the tomb. Um, and 
that hope that was that allowed us to clear tombs rapidly um, from the path of the roadway. Um, in terms of recording, we were doing we were doing all plans with, from digitised rectified pole photography, uh, and which was then rectified to the southwest grid peg, um, which were given then located by a total station given WJC4 uh, coordinate systems and a height above sea level by the contractors. We tend to do them in batches of locational areas. Um, and uh, all contexts were dug through the MOLAS manual, uh, single context uh, recording systems, um, using the sheets developed by Craig, Craig Spence at uh, Bristol Cross Tester University. Um, and on teams that needed multiple photographs to cover the, the areas we used, uh, they were stitched together using Agile Sofa Photos Cam, which was in places a little bit. Um, there was a bit too much warping going on, but uh, overall it was very successful in a way of rapidly, excavate, rapidly recording and excavating. Um, exposed stone structures. So that's what they look like. Irritating piles of stones. Um, it's quite, often quite difficult to tell where the, the genuine wall begins and the tumble uh, stops. So that's one of the reasons we took so many pole photos before we started, um, because that way we could at least attempt back at the uh, dig house, having found the sites, to attempt to find out, work out where the uh, the tumble was at least um, ending. Initial survey looks a bit like fishing. Um, pole, photo, pole photos of the sites and then uh, cardinal uh, photos of each uh, individual site. Stone clearance, that's what they look like when they've had all the tumble and other bits and bobs removed. And then uh, chamber excavations um, to try and recover as many, as much uh, human remains and artifacts from within the, t the chambers as possible. Um, a very small number of skeletal remains. The preservation of bone in this area is abysmal, uh, to be honest. Um, it's very, very dry, very, very acidic, um, and it really does knacker all the bones. Um, and then, quick, and then half section them to look at the actual structure. Um, unlike all of the Italian teams who are working on other projects, who found beautiful, beautiful things in colossal amounts. We, <laughs> we found 600 pieces of pottery, uh, 20 beads, and uh, I think it was 50 recorded finds. It was almost nothing. Um, and of those 600, those shares came from one tomb. And that's partly because uh, there's been so much uh, site robbing in antiquity. Um, Almost every single grave was heavily disturbed in some capacity. Um, so you're losing an awful lot of the dating of evidence that you require to actually try and date these sites. One of us, one of the serious problems we had as a as a, a mission was actually putting our work into context um, because there's no, there's very little bone. The desert environments also destroy much of the collagen, um, so we had very little chance of C14 dating. So we had to turn to tomb architecture um, to, to attempt to classify and date some of these structures, um, which follows on from work by Freifelt, uh, Yule and others, many others working in the Northern Oman, and working with the researchers from the Rostak Batna Archaeological uh, Survey to include their extensive local knowledge. Um, and this allowed us to take what was a very poor um, data set and bring it into, a, into line with research and work that's been done in the area already. Um, to give you a rough timeline of uh, Omani archaeology, you have the Neolithic from 5,000 to 3,200, uh, the Hafit, which is the sort of late Neolithic, early Bronze Age, uh, from 3,200 to 2,500 BC. The Umanar, um, which are the those fantastic tombs from Bat, are Umanar tombs. Uh, Wadi Souk, um, which has some odd tombs, they've not really been very well classified. And then the early Iron Age, uh, late Iron Age, Hellenistic, Sasanian, and Islamic period as well. Uh, there's no Islamic archaeology in this because the majority of the stuff we were finding on there were Islamic graves and you are not allowed to excavate them, uh, as well, certainly not as Western archaeologists. Um, but there's very strict laws in most of the Middle East about uh, disturbing Islamic uh, graves and it's, just, it's really not worth the bother. And it also is horrifically culturally insensitive if you do, so we didn't. Um, we had one site from the Omani Neolithic, which is incredibly rare. Um, it was a flint scatter um, around some other 
small stone structures which we think were graves. Again, the bone is almost completely well, There's no bone at all at that site, but they have similar. Uh, oh, I should be another slide now. Sorry. They have similar um, styles in uh, layout to other Oman, uh, the other uh, small number of other Neolithic tombs from Oman. Um, type one. So we've categorised the tombs into uh, eight overall types. Type one tombs are these small circular ones, generally one to one to two, one meter in the middle, and then three to five meters across, made out of angular stones in a rough corbelling pattern to make a, a, a sort of beehive style tomb. Um, and these are very similar to the Hafiz style, uh, Hafiz style of, of uh, tombs, so the early, late Neolithic, early uh, Bronze Age tombs in the area. Um, we had almost no Umanar archaeology in the area, certainly none of these huge, fantastically well preserved tombs. Um, just one pottery vessel from uh, a tomb that's potentially uh, a similar one to a Wadi Souk um, layout and had Wadi Souk um, artefacts that also were aligned with it, but still had a, an Umanar style vessel in this so that's unusual. Um, type 5 tombs with these low, they were all heavily damaged, um, tombs with a small central chamber, sub subsurface chamber um, in a sort of circular pattern, um, which is similar to some Wadi Souk uh, style tombs from, uh, where's that one from? Uh, I think that's from Yule's publication, uh, in Northern Oman, and a small soapstone vessel, um, which is with a. Normally they have a circular, circle and dot uh, decoration on them, and usually this one didn't. Um, but it, this, the shape and the, and the uh, uh, is quite typical of the Wadi Souk period. Um, along with that, we also have Type Six tombs, which are these D-shaped ones, which are similar to other Wadi Souk ones found um, again by Yule up in the north. Uh, type 7 tombs, which are a selection of tombs that are quite unusual. It's mostly these three um, ones clustered together, um, <coughs> which are similar in style to uh, some ones from the Wadi Al Jizi in northern Oman, again excavated by Yule, um, which we're not entirely sure of. They had a small number of beads, but again, they were very badly damaged and very difficult to date. Um, could be Wadi Souk, could be Iron Age, it's not really clear. Um, and then Type 8 were non-funerary structures, so you had these small temporary encampments. There's an idea that that one on the uh, top left is possibly left over from the Civil War, and it's actually a gun uh, a sniper position. Um, that one's got some uh, writing in that has two people's names spelled out with stones, so we think that's quite modern. <laughs> and other sort of uh, little Wadi walls um, to try and direct uh, Wadi flow to and from different parts of the field um, found. And then uh, type 2 tombs were these ones made out of, they had double walls of well wad, uh, rounded wadi stones with a central um, packing of, of more uh, angular stones which have um, a platform base where the body is potentially laid out on. Um, and they're very similar to these uh, Grubenhauser, not Grubenhauser, um, hut style tombs, um, again from Northern Oman. The problem coming with this is that these are, we think, these, the, the, the hut style tombs are definitely Iron Age, um, and we have a suspicion that these tombs are also Iron Age. And again, we have very little ceramic evidence, very little dating evidence at all. The bone survival in these tombs was moderate. There, were, there was bone survival in these tombs, whereas in the Type 1 Hafiz tombs, there was nothing. And we having to use that conjectural evidence as a su suggestion that these tombs are considerably later than the uh, Hafid ones. Um, and type 4 type tombs, which are these honeycomb style multiple chamber, um, add, you add an extra chamber on when someone else dies, which are typically Iron Age and can have up to uh, 50 or 60 different cells within them in some of the larger excavations that have been found. We had uh, two or three of them around as well. And finally, type 3 tombs, which had the best uh, bone survival of any of them, um, with still with some human remains laid out in them, um, which are typical of a, of a late Iron Age Hellenistic style um, graves that are also found in this area of northern Oman, um, which were easily, yeah, 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 easily had the best survival of any um, of the tombs out there. 
Um, and, and areas of Islamic archaeology as well. Ooh. Big one. Um, as you can see, they are grouped in locations around the, uh, on ridge tops generally, um, across the Batna as you go along the, uh, the highway route. Um, generally found in, sim in similar areas to each other, so they're, they're reusing areas of the landscape repeatedly by uh, these pieces of, of funerary architecture. Because of this, the only way we could actually get dates out of this was to tie in with other projects, um, which we wanted to do anyway. But uh, So we were able to send details of our work to the Dutch team working on pack Package 6 to help them with their understanding of the archaeology they were finding. We worked extensively with the Rostock Butner survey, um, and working six-day weeks and very long days, we were able to produce a um, interim report within two weeks of finishing the overall excavation and to be handed into the uh, Omani authorities before we left, um, which was then uh, published as a full report with uh, fines and um, environmental studies, the minimal environmental studies we had. Uh, uh, it was part of the B British Foundation for Study of Arabian Monograph series. Um, and we were also playing with doctoral research at Durham University and uh, Sultan Caboose University as well. Um, outcomes from this, we have a better understanding of the Batana uh, archaeology, the archaeology of the Batana, although a lot more work is required to actually gain a handle on that. Um, some hints towards a better classification of Omani prehistoric tomb architecture. The type 1 tombs, the Hafit tombs, the ridges in this part of Omani are absolutely covered in s similar tombs to that, but it's very difficult when you first look at them to see whether they are of a type 1 feet style um, architecture or a type 2 um, Iron Age structure and realistically the only way to look at it is to excavate them and look at the stone, uh, the way that the, the tomb walls are constructed. If they are made out of angular stone in a one sort of corbelled pile they are most likely to be her feet, whereas if you've got this double wall with a, an angular stone uh, central uh, filling then they are more likely to be this Iron Age uh, structure there. Um, a clear potential, a clear demonstration of the potential, but also limits of using remote sensing surveys to uh, identify sites within the Middle East. Um, it's a brilliant area because there's not a lot of vegetation cover, so you can see a lot of things in the landscape from remote sensing. But obviously, you're also missing an awful lot of stuff that's not extant within the landscape, um, and we were, we, did, we will have missed an awful lot of stuff in that. Um, and we were able to prove to the Ministry of Heritage and Culture that rapid survey and excavation was a reliable option and that full publication within two years was practical for their work. Um, oh, that is an outdated slide. That's very embarrassing. Mm -hmm. There should be a lot more words after His Excellency. Um, <laughs> <laughs> oh, oh, dear. It's not here, He's not here. That's true. That's true. Um, Many thanks to His Excellency the Minister for Heritage and Culture, who is potentially going to become the next Salt Never Mind. Oh, God. <laughs> it's a good thing I'm not working out there anymore. <laughs> um, a huge thanks to uh, Sultan uh, Nasar al Bakri, the D Director of Archaeology and Museums, uh, to the Ministry of Heritage and Culture itself, the, and all of their staff who helped us, um, to the Anglo Omani Society, Rostak al Batna Survey, Logical Survey, Durham University, Salt Kaboos. And to the team, uh, Derek Kennett, and Mortimer, Dr. Julian Janssen van, van Rensburg, Jack uh, Outram, Adam Fraser, Alan, Alison Kane, Adel Abmothbassi, Huffel Abmothbassi, uh, Vince Trevini, and Othman Altani. Um, so thanks to them as well. Um, I'm really sorry it's been quite a rush through on that, um, but that's me going to walk up into the sunset. Yeah.